this one stops at three sigma, then it is outside. There's also a, a, a bound here from the X mass. But if you relax a little bit the uh, uh, constraints, then this uh, SPS 1A point is inside. And also, it depends a bit on the top mass, which has been going up and down a little bit in the last few years. So. so the next question is, given that you have the uh, correct hierarchy, is there enough branching ratio to do this kind of analysis? And what you need is that the quark should have a significant branching ratio to give a neutralino and a quark. Secondly, the neutralino should have a significant branching ratio to give a stepton and a lepton. So here we look at the gluino branching ratio. Some of these uh, squarks come from gluino decay. And in black here is listed uh, the uh, branching ratio to squark and quark. And that is for a different... Uh, let skip that. <coughs> here, the left-handed squark branching ratios are given we're interested in chi 2, which is the, um, the dark points. And, and the, this kind of plot doesn't mean that, uh, that at the dark point it goes to a neutralino and a quark. Within a certain area, the amount of black versus yellow gives the ratios between these two channels. And here I have written in the numbers, uh, it's 30% more branching ratio goes into neutralino and the cork. Uh, that is again the other plane which contains benchmark point SPS 1B. Uh, here is the corresponding right handed cork. But that does not decay at all into uh, type 2, so that cannot be used. Also, the light quarks. In, in, in the case of light uh, uh, quarks, U and D, uh, left and right, are believed to be uh, distinct uh, uh, squarks. But in the case of the uh, heavier flavors like uh, top and bottom, the corresponding squarks mix. So here we have a B1, and that's a corresponding B2. And they also have a significant branching ratio into the palitos and uh, corresponding works. This is B2, the heavier one. And finally, we want the neutralino chi 2 to have a significant branching ratio into uh, steptons. And here we have 12 and 5% at 2 points on this SPS 1A line. So we are considering the SPS uh, 1A line, which is defined by a certain linear relation between M0 and M1 half, which you've seen as this uh, uh, line in the plane, and the condition on the uh, bilinear coupling A0 plus values of tangent beta equal to 10 and uh, the sine of mutual be positive. And we have considered uh, two particular points on that line where M0 is respectively 100 and 160 GeV and these are the values for M1 half. The point alpha is the point which is normally referred to as SPS 1A and that has a uh, uh, a large cross-section for producing these supersymmetric particles. The point beta is higher up, so the masses are higher and the cross-sections are lower. And we wanted to see if one could also do something at that point. Here are the spectra. Uh, there are two lines, one for alpha and one for beta. You see the glurino is uh, here at the point alpha, it's 600 GeV. The, uh, the point beta is 900, 
the scores are typically for alpha point 540 down to 500. The uh, neutralino <coughs> is 176, the spectrum is 140, and the LSP is 96. This was all at the point of the alpha. And, and these masses are determined by integrating the renormalization group equations down from the unification scale uh, according to a certain uh, code that's how they are defined. So and the stop is heavy. Sorry? The stop is heavy. The stop? Where is the stop? It's here. It's, uh, it's compared to the other scores. It is not one of those particular scenarios with, with the light stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Here are masses and widths. Uh, in red uh, are those that we uh, have considered and through our additional uh, particles plotted now as functions of n one half. And the width is typically 1% of the uh, mass. And the wiggles here have to do with numerical uh, Lack of position in this in this routine. The cross sections are of the order of uh, pico barns, falling with uh, with uh, increasing masses. Uh, we are interested in the squark chain. The squark can be produced in different ways. It can be produced from uh, from their production of gluinos. <coughs> we can have a gluino produced together with a left-handed score. We can have a gluino with a right-handed score. We can have left and left, left and right, right and right. Different cross sections. So uh, quantifying the cascade. Uh, these are the cross sections for producing left-handed squark, and by left-handed squark, I, I refer to the sum of all the uh, <coughs> flavors U, D, S, and C. And here are the uh, corresponding values for the uh, B uh, squarks. The branching ratio to chi 2 is 12%. Sorry, what I pointed to here are these are the, uh, the branch ratios for getting a, 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 for getting a neutrino chi 2 from one of these scores. And this is the branch ratio for getting a stepdon from the neutralino. And finally, the stepdon decays 100% to a lepton and the LSP. But there's a significant reduction in both in rate and in branching ratio when going from this point alpha to theta. The, uh, the way the masses are determined is from the uh, from the uh, kinematics, uh, and here this is illustrated for a simple uh, example, namely the uh, lepton pair. The chi 2 decays to a stepton, and uh, the first lepton, which is referred to as lepton near, and by simple kinematics, if you go to the rest frame of this lepton, the uh, lepton mass, excuse me, the lepton momentum, which is measured, is given in terms of the uh, masses involved. In the same way, when the septum decays to the LSP and the second lepton, again the momentum of that lepton is given in terms of the ratio involving the masses of the septum and the LSP. So combining those two momenta, uh, the maximum would be when they are back to back in the septum breastplate, and then the, the mass squared would be just four times the product of those two momenta, and that gives this kind of formula, which is the prototype of the endpoint formulas. You have a maximum of some distribution given in terms of masses of particles involved.
But in this case, there are three masses involved as the uh, chi 2, the heavier neutralino, there's the chi 1, the lightest neutralino, and there's the slepton. So there are three masses which are unknown and one kinematical endpoint. So we need more such formulas to solve for the masses. By adding the squark, we can form more invariants. There's the quark left on left on mass, the quark left on near, quark left on far, and the di left on. So then we have four uh, invariants and, and, and four masses. But uh, it's not quite <coughs> as simple as that uh, because the two leptons cannot be distinguished. We don't know which is the lepton near and which is the lepton far. But for each event, one can uh, separate them into a, a low and a high mass from the two leptons. This is well defined. And each of those will have, uh, will have maximum. Uh, the second complication is that for some of the invariants there will be uh, multiple cases. The endpoint formula will depend on the mass ratio. In the case of the dilepton mass, it was uh, unique and simple. But in general, there will be different formulas depending on the mass ratios. The third complication is that there are multiple spork masses. We saw that the uh, uh, B squarks have different masses from the U and L squarks, and even the U and L squarks have different masses. And the fourth complication is that the endpoints are not always linearly independent. But uh, these uh, mass uh, extrema can be worked out. Here are formulas. This was the dilepton mass I showed <coughs> explicitly how that is determined. In the case of the quark lepton lepton mass, the maxima are given by four different expressions depending on, on the mass ratios of adjacent uh, superparticle uh, superparticles. So there are four cases. And these low and high masses uh, they are uh, also uh, given by, by three different formulas depending on, on ratios of the masses. So, uh, altogether there are four times three cases, which we will denote in this uh, way within a bracket, but only nine of the twelve are reversed. And there's also a threshold here, uh, which can be used to give uh, more information. The theory uh, curves are given by phase space, and this is the dilepton one, which is just uh, a triangle. The quark lepton lepton here, you see it starts to get more complicated, and that's because you have different formulas describing the mass depending on the ratio. And it's uh, one is actually the maximum of this QLL mass. Here's a threshold. And here are some complicated ones. Alpha and beta refer to these SPS 1A points, and these are chosen just because they give uh, different strange shapes. So, uh, a couple of conclusions are that there are many different shapes, and secondly, the edges are not linear, so it may be difficult to, uh, to extrapolate here and determine exactly where is the edge, the maximum. These uh, formulas for endpoints can be inverted. Here's one example in the region 1 1. Then the symmetric. Uh, particle masses can be given by explicit formulas. A, B, C, D are these maxima. Uh, if we have 
four endpoints and four masses, and if the situation is linear, which is not always the case, then it's a unique solution. But we may use more endpoints, uh, then the system will be over constrained. They will come with uncertainties, and in uh, practice one will do a fit, but these inversion formulas will then be used to start the fit. But because the formulas are composite, as you saw from these uh, strange shapes, there will be multiple uh, solutions. So to study to study what position one can get, we did uh, an LHC simulation using these Monte Carlo programs and the simulation. Excuse me, this is a Monte Carlo program. This defines the level energy model from the high energy parameters, and this is the simulation of the Atlas detector. Use some cuts which are designed to remove the standard model background. There is a little bit left, but that's mostly TP bound. And here you see the dilepton mass. Uh, in uh, black is what comes out of this simulation. In uh, blue is the theory curve from the signal chain. And uh, the two leptons which descend from a neutralino must have the same flavor. It cannot be one muon and one electron. They have to be either two muons or two electrons or two tau. Uh, but there are also other supersymmetric uh, decay chains which can lead to two leptons of the same flavor, and uh, and those can be removed by simply subtracting the different flavor uh, conversion, because other backgrounds will be equally distributed between same flavor and uh, different flavors, so they can be subtracted, and that's how we get from this initial same flavor distribution in red down to the black one, which is same flavor minus different flavor. And you see the standard model background is very low. There's a peak here for the set zero. Here is the other point on that SPS1A line. And the data are not as good, but still you can see some, uh, some correspondence between them black data points here and the blue the theory curve. <coughs> the QLL distribution, again, there's some reasonable agreement up there near the edge. Here, uh, in red, uh, is shown a fit to the edge from which the uh, maximum is determined. And this triangle shape from the dilemma distribution is very uh, <coughs> even in the beta, uh, beta point. Uh, but uh, when it gets a bit more complicated, like four left on left on and, and some of these others, the, the position goes down. And uh, that is to some extent due to, to various backgrounds. But here are some numbers for uh, the uh, edge values dilepton mass, quark lepton, lepton, QL low, QL high, etc. These are nominal values, and those are values obtained from fitting to Monte Carlo data. And you see the agreement is quite good for some of them, but then there are others which we did not succeed in determining. There's also a, an uncertainty on these values from not knowing the energy scale uh, precisely. The energy for a, uh, for a core object <laughs> is, uh, I think it's 1%, which is the number we use. 1% uncertainty. But the total uncertainty is actually dominated by the statistical one. I mentioned briefly one complication due to multiple spork masses. Here you see the two B sporks. 
have different mass <coughs> identified by 2530-35GEB. In the case of the uh, L and DL, difference is maybe 5 GEB. But that is the kind of precision which we hope to achieve. So, so this uh, can in some cases be a problem. Because there are two masses, there will be two endpoints. But uh, the higher one will also come with a lower uh, rate because the cross-section is lower. So it tends to get blurred into the uh, background. <coughs> so uh, having seen that, that one can determine these uh, endpoints with some precision, we did a simulation of 10,000 Atlas experiments and focused on the statistical uncertainty. We assume that the nominal value would be reproduced and, and we just focused on... How long does it take to get 10,000 experiments? Uh, depends on the computer resource, maybe, maybe uh, a few days, maybe a week. So what does it mean? Uh, in Okay, what it means is that you uh, you define one experiment to be a certain number of events and uh, you have a Lemnotti, you have a cross-section, then you get that number of events and simulating 10,000 experiments means that you simulate them 10,000 times that number of events which is uh, definition of experiment. So we take these endpoints to be uh, given by the nominal value plus a uncertainty from statistical fluctuations and an uncertainty from not knowing the scale and then uh, construct uh, something like a, a chi squared uh, function which is minimized and where the theory value to be compared with the experimental value is uh, a function of the masses we want to determine. And here are results for uh, this delta sigma, that chi squared function less than one. In green is the nominal uh, value. In this bluish color is the fit value. When the fit uh, converges to the right solution. In red is the false fit, which sometimes appears because of the fact that these uh, these mass formulas and their inversions are not analytic, they have this composite structure. Okay, I don't think I want to go into that. But there is a certain probability of finding more than one minimum and uh, in this case it's the one one minimum which is the correct one but you see with uh, with uh, delta sigma equal to 1, there's a 17% chance of finding a wrong minimum. <coughs> Here uh, we show the spread of uh, mass values. Here's the spork mass at 550, roughly. The B spork is somewhat lower. The neutralino chi 2, the slepton, and the LSP. And in green are shown the results of false solutions. They are shifted a bit to the left, and they are smaller, indicating a lower probability. And the red uh, peaks show mass differences. They are determined with a much higher precision. And that's the corresponding thing for the beta point. The uh, lightest uh, masses are very much correlated from these uh, uh, ways of, of determining them. So uh, if one can fix one of them, then one gets uh, a much improved result. And that can be done using input from a linear collider which would determine the LSP mass 
to a very high precision and basically fixing it for the purposes of the LHC analysis. So you see now that if you, um, if you do that, if you have such data available, the uh, second solution, the fourth solution, is got in the case of SPS 1A alpha. And uh, in the case of uh, beta, uh, I've forgotten exactly how it goes. Um, the, the, the false, in this case, it's the 1 2 solution, which is the correct one. Uh, but there's a 1 3 solution which is nearby. One can also extend this to include the Gluino. Then there's one more mass, but many more edges can be constructed. But also, there's a problem then with combinatorial background because there are so many jets coming out from these uh, cascades. To get around that problem of, uh, of uh, combinatorics, uh, one can use for the purposes of getting the Gluino mass, we can use the B squarks and not the ordinary squarks. That, uh, that cuts the background down from something like 80% to maybe 35%, which is manageable. And I, has, I had some numbers, but I, I, I hit them because I didn't think I would have time to show them. So let me just summarize. The SPS1A simply masses can be determined with a position of 4 to 10 GeV. But this is within that uh, framework of that uh, reference point. But there's a non-zero probability of fitting to the wrong minimum. That can be removed if one uses the collider input for the LSP mass. That will remove the ambiguity and also in, increase the position significantly. Isn't that just a question of where you're starting? I mean, I'm imagining some kind of, you know, they can fit on so far in the minimum or something like that, depending where you're starting. So well, if the income where you're starting, yeah. Um, sure I understood exactly what you meant. But, if but, I have a function with two minutes, yeah. depending where I take my starting point, it's my, and depending on the routine I use, I will find one. Well, it's a little time. more than, than, than fixing the starting point. It also, uh, from the LHC uh, data now, you, you get quite good precision on these differences between masses, but you don't get the overall scale with the same, uh, with the same precision which is seen fairly explicitly from these inversion formulas. But when you use the LSP input, you can actually fix the LSP mass. And, and then you sort of fix the whole scheme. So it's a bit more than, than just yeah. starting the right place. Uh, we believe this could still be improved if one could uh, understand better the backgrounds. And, and, and by the way, the main background is from supersymmetry, not to understand the model. And also, a uh, better understanding of the fitting is believed to, to be very difficult. And then the final, final remark is that um, there is some more recent work now on, uh, on describing the actual mass distributions, not only the maxima, and that is believed to also lead to a better position in this information. Okay, thank you. We don't know actually if the Sabino at Subra is a bad way. So, you can check to exclude the minimal Subra or I mean, is it easy to, suppose you have a different, different masses, is it easy to check that or? Well, you wouldn't, uh, suppose you determine, well, the scenario may be such that this kind of analysis doesn't apply, though.
Yeah. But assume now that the analysis suffice and you get some masses from M0 and M1. Well, the next question is, will M0 and M1 have to be concepts which you would use them in the scenario you would not? And, and, and that you will probably see when you try to extrapolate all the masses you obtain, you will see that it doesn't, it's not consistent. We will soon, we will know very soon, once you find something. I think there's a good chance if one finds something, one would know whether it has to do with the or something very different. Thank you. Thank you.